Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Monica Jan Drejcik will defend the academic thesis Revitalizing Lignin on Lignin Applications in Materials and Additives. May I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis. Dear Prorector, dear members of the Corona, dear guests, dear online viewers, in the next 15 minutes I would like to present the research which I did, which is presented in this thesis. The motivation for this research is transition. We transition from linear economy to circular economy, and one of the motivations and one of the aspects of circular economy is a use of renewable resources. One of the resources is lignin coming from lignocellulosic biomass. Lignin is present in plants. It's present in uh, wood grasses and next to cellulose and hemicellulose creates wood. The role of lignin in uh, biomass is uh, to give its structural strength and provide for binding together cellulose and hemicellulose. Lignin itself is based on free phenylpropanoid uh, mole molecules, free alcohols uh, presented on the slides, which create three basic units, parahydroxyphenol, guaiacyl, and cerigol uh, unit, and these units are enzymatically cross-linked to create different kind of carbon-carbon uh, and carbon-oxygen bonds. Approximately Seven, uh, 70 million tons of uh, lignin is produced annually from feedstock like uh, wood. And there are a couple of different methods how we can uh, obtain lignin from uh, biomass. And currently, we mostly utilize cellulose first uh, approaches. So, in this uh, kind of lignin separation methods, first we concentrate on getting cellulose out, and lignin is treated as byproduct. Due to the harsh processing method in cellulose first biorefineries, lignin, which is present afterwards, is usually of low quality. Therefore, there is emerging lignin first uh, strategies where lignin is the first product and then cellulose can be processed uh, further. Alternatively, once lignin is isolated, different depolymerization techniques can be used to... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm a bit nervous. Uh, to depolymerize lignin into different molecules, um, which can fervently be utilized as chemicals and uh, in materials. Lignin, which is currently produced is quite polydispersed. Therefore, fractionation techniques such as extraction using different organic solvents, precipitation using different pH, or membrane technology are used to narrow down the dispersity of lignin, and therefore the fractions which can be obtained afterwards are more defined in terms of their structure and molecular weight. Coming back to most more interesting uh, part of uh, my research, going to applications. From approximately 60 million tons of lignin produced annually, only less than 5% of lignin is used for the applications other than uh, burning for energy. Therefore, I want to present the alternatives. The most obvious alternative uh, of use of lignin is to depolymerize it and use it as source for chemicals, but lignin as such can be used also in polymeric materials, can be used as surfactant, dispersant, as a precursor for carbonous materials. In fact, the applications of lignin are quite broad and we should not concentrate on just burning it for energy and we should really focus on applying lignin as such or in depolymerized form. And speaking of using lignin, it, quite often you have to modify its structure in order to apply it uh, in certain applications. And you, you, there are a couple of different ways you can approach this. You can modify its phenolic OH, like presented on the slide above. And in my research, uh, 
I put a lot of effort in two of these modifications. I alkylated lignin and I esterified it. But alternatively, you can modify its aromatic ring. You can modify its methoxy group to demethoxylate its structure, or you can modify caloboxylic groups present uh, on its structure as well. That brings me to the objective of my thesis. The main objective of my work was to valorize lignin fractions originating from different processing methods. And to valorize these fractions, I developed a couple of different applications, such as adhesives, coating, additives, and carbonous materials. But before I was able to do so, I had to answer a couple of important questions. First of all, what are the characteristics of lignin originated from different processing methods, fractionated lignin? This was a bit of a black box in uh, this research, and therefore I had to study this in more detail, uh, how different processing methods influence the properties, before I was able to develop different methodologies to incorporate lignin in materials and additives, followed by studying the properties of the materials, as well as studying of relationship, what properties of lignin fractions itself can bring to different polymeric materials. And first application I would like to present are lignin-based additives, adhesives, sorry. Uh, in this approach, I use a lignin, which I modified, so lignin was bearing triple bonds, uh, which was used in thiolene uh, cross-linking chemistry with different molecules of thiols. In this research, I used lignin fraction, which was uh, a technical lignin, as well as lignin after mild solvolysis, and I studied the influence of reactive diluent, which was custom-made molecule I synthesized myself, which was a phenolic uh, compound, uh, which was also bearing triple bonds. Subsequently, I cross-linked uh, the resins, which were created, and I tested their performance as wood adhesives. And it turned out that Compared to phenolformaldehyde uh, resins, their performance was really well or even better than phenolformaldehyde, which brings it as a very promising starting point uh, because phenolformaldehyde resins are the main application of lignin in uh, polymeric materials. Inspired by this research, uh, we continued uh, with a more ambitious approach. In the next chapter, I developed lignin-based coatings. The chemistry which was used was the same, but starting materials were completely different. In starting material, in this uh, part, I used uh, depolymerized lignin fractions, which were a mixture of monomers, oligomers, and dimers. And this was more ambitious because I was modifying the mixture as such before using, instead of using a pre-made uh, reactive diluent. In this research, I also tested what is the influence of fractionation, and I used a mixture which was obtained after depolymerization as such. I used a fraction which was uh, extracted and purified by membranes. And the lignin-based uh, resins which were used as coatings were tested as uh, anti-corrosive uh, coatings and the performance which we obtained was uh, really remarkable and that was one of the best uh, lignin-based anti-corrosive coatings which was reported in the literature. And to my surprise, the fraction which performed the best was based on lignin used as mixture. And this is quite remarkable because quite frankly, we never expected that if you use lignin a mixture as such, the performance would be so good. And it's common general knowledge that uh, in order to obtain good properties, you should uh, isolate lignin-based oligomers and monomers first. But that was not the case. And the, uh, and the best uh, part about this is that if you don't isolate lignin-based monomers and oligomers, uh, you save yourself a lot of costs, costly, uh, cost, costly processes, which are required to isolate it. And therefore, you save yourself a lot of work, money, and in the end, you decrease environmental impact of, uh, of the resins which uh, 
can be obtained if you uh, obta if you skip this uh, isolation step. Next chapter uh, of the thesis is concentrating on adhesive on additives, <laughs> and in this chapter I used modified lignin, and uh, here I esterified it with uh, palmitic acid moieties, in order to obtain uh, lignin-based fractions, which are miscible with castor oils. If you don't modify a lignin, unfortunately, the obtaining biolubricants are not miscible, uh, therefore, uh, we had to modify them. Biolubricants, which I obtained, uh, were tested in a couple of different ways. First of all, I tested what is, what are the antioxidant properties of lignin fractions uh, which I obtained and what is the influence of these properties, uh, of what, is, what are antioxidant properties in terms of uh, their molecular weight and uh, functionality. But I also tested the biolubricants uh, sample as what is the thermooxidative uh, stability of the samples as well as uh, their rubricity and uh, rheological performance. And it turned out that lignin fractions which were studied here had remarkable uh, performance and uh, it is quite uh, promising to use uh, these kind of uh, biolubricants as a gear uh, box uh, oils uh, or so. And uh, I will finish with the last uh, application which I developed uh, in this work. And this application is lignin-based carbonous materials. And in this work, I modified lignin to use a uh, Kleisen rearrangement uh, to create uh, lignin-based mesoporous carbons. Uh, to obtain mesoporous carbons, I mixed uh, lignin uh, with template, polymeric uh, molecule, and upon carbonization, template was removed, and I obtained a series of uh, mesoporous carbons obtained using different templates. And these uh, carbonous materials were tested as humic acid absorbent. And this is very important application because if humic acid is not removed from the samples uh, of water prior its uh, purification, that can lead to uh, remaining cancerous compounds. And that's, of course, something we wish to avoid. And that brings me uh, to the last part, conclusions. In my thesis, I tested uh, a set of uh, lignin samples which were obtained via different isolation and fractionation techniques. And I developed proof of concept applications as additives, co uh, carbonous materials and uh, polymeric materials. And I studied what is structure properties relationship of this material. Uh, and I concluded that lignin can be used for something more than just burned for energy. And as a future outlook, I would like to bring your attention to lignin as a material which has a lot of potential and it's our role to, to bring these applications up, to develop them fervently. And in my work, I simply developed a proof of concept, but I truly believe that these materials should be fervently optimized and introduced to the market uh, s someday. And last uh, remark I want to finish my presentation is, in lignocellulosic uh, biomass field, it's very common to say one can make anything from lignin except from money. And when I started my PhD, I believe that the statement was true. Nowadays, maybe we are not here yet, but I believe that we are on very good way to be here. And in a couple of years, and with increasing attention to introduce more and more bio-based materials, I truly believe that lignin has a great potential to be one of the major uh, players in the field. Thank you for your attention. Dear Prorector, I give you a word back. Thank you very much for your uh, interesting presentation. Uh, so then now it's time to move to the uh, discussion part of, uh, of the ceremony. Uh, and before doing so, I would like to introduce the supervisory team because they are not going to ask questions as usual. And, uh, and there's other way, otherwise no, no way to know that this is Dr. Bernhardt 
uh, and Professor Pich, who have been supervising uh, the candidates. Uh, we also have a number of um, foreign and uh, foreign participants in the ceremony who will be participating online, uh, and, and someone also from elsewhere in the Netherlands, so you will see them coming by. But I would like to thank everyone who is participating very much uh, with taking the time and joining us in this uh, ceremony. My own name is uh, Ralf Peters. I will be acting as the pro-rector today and try and guide you through the uh, ceremony. So then, now it's time uh, for uh, the first opposition. Uh, it will be opened by Professor uh, Honing, um, who's a professor in analytical chemistry uh, at this university, and he has also been acting as the chair of the assessment committee. Please, Professor Honing. Thank you, uh, Mr. Prorector. Um, dear candidate, uh, first of all, congratulations, and also to the supervisors for this, uh, I would say, nice green book, and, uh, uh, and especially what I liked is the explorative nature in finding where we can valorize lignina in its application. So uh, definitely uh, well done, uh, beautiful work. Congratulations. Um, but always there's questions. So I would like to ask one of your paranymphs, uh, um, uh, we say in Dutch, uh, to read uh, proposition number eight. Right, so proposition number eight. When designing an experiment, one should carefully consider how to analyze its outcome, whether all required analytical techniques are reliable and readily available. Yeah, and actually I don't have a question. I want to thank you very much off the bottom of my heart, because these are typical statements not made by non-analytical chemists. So thank you and keep on spreading the word. Uh, uh, very important for me. Um, then let's go to number nine. So can someone read proposition number nine? Uh, so proposition number nine, intellectual property rights protection is a key uh, in transforming academic research results into their commercializing and uh, marketable solution. And the link. Yeah. Um, I would like to ask you, what's intellectual property for you? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. And thank you for appreciation of my uh, propositions. Uh, I also agree that uh, analytical chemistry is often underestimated and we should uh, really pay more attention to properly uh, acknowledge uh, the work of analytical chemists uh, because without it, we couldn't use the techniques as we uh, can right now. And I think that the whole research as such greatly benefits uh, from the work of analytical chemists. Uh, so they are a lot our little heroes, <laughs> often behind the scenes. Uh, but coming back to proposition number uh, nine, intellectual property is a very broad uh, field. And to me, as a trainee patent attorney, uh, this proposition had a very uh, special meaning because during uh, the process of uh, writing this thesis and performing research, we tried to uh, patent uh, one of the chapters, and that was an inspiration for me. And I truly believe uh, that we should try to protect intellectual property. But, but, so patenting is protection of IP? One of the forms, yes. But do you really protect it? Uh, because after the patent, it's open for everyone. Uh, so you give away intellectual property and Coca-Cola has no patents and nobody knows the formula of Coca-Cola. So what's the rationale behind this protection? And anyway, by the way, you are an academic, so you are not supposed to protect your IP. Do you agree? So as per Coca-Cola, yes, Coca-Cola is protected by other forms of IP, such as trademarks. Uh, but speaking about protection of intellectual property, uh, it is one part to, to file a patent application, but it doesn't stop spreading, uh, spreading the knowledge, in my opinion, because only because patent application is filed, and by the way, patent applications are also available to public at some point, uh, there is, uh, authors of, of the patent can still uh, file, uh, can still publish their work in scientific journals, so in that respect, uh, in my view, it's not stopping from sharing the knowledge. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, But basically your statement is you need a patent, otherwise you cannot commercialize your uh, research. That's still your statement, I would say. But now you well, say yes, but no, a little bit, sometimes yes. The statement yes. is that th- it definitely helps to have Voilà, okay, then, then at least patent. we are agreeing that it should be a little bit more nuanced uh, with the word help and then... Uh, We agree on that. Uh, maybe la- for later to uh, to continue there, and it's better to go to into the science itself. And I would like to go to page number 22, uh, and there on the top, uh, you're speaking about, uh, or 23, sorry, 22, 23, on uh, the change of the physical chemical properties of the lignin. And then you speak as an example, the solubility in organic solvents but the solubility in organic solvents that can be polar organic solvents uh, uh, like methanol or, or benzene which is extremely apolar so are you only looking to solubility as a property or also log p or log d so speaking uh, about solubility as such we are in fact looking into more uh, proper into properties like uh, Uh, PKA or, or so, so which influence the solubility in different solvents. And I agree that uh, it's very well spotted uh, that we should also, I should also pay attention uh, more into defining which solvents I had in mind because they uh, strongly differ in their properties. And, and, and would you agree because you are working in your thesis uh, and I completely agree on monomers, dimers and oligomers. Uh, that the solubility is also related to their molecular mass, I would even say. And then linked to that is molecular mass a property. Mm. Yes. Yeah? Uh, I'm not, uh, sorry, I'm not sure whether I fully understand your question. So so you, you, you clearly state that solubility, PKA, are properties which define the solubility, linked also mm-hmm. to the log P, to the molecules. And then you say, okay, it can become soluble in organic uh, matter. But then uh, I would ask, this is not only dependent on the PKA or the log P, log D, of, no. or, the sol- or the solvation of a molecule, but also the molecular mass. So the oligomers, per definition, will be more difficult to dissolve in certain solvents than the monomers. Or is this not what you mean? That's one of the, uh, the things I, I meant indeed, that if you have uh, lignin-based uh, monomers and oligomers, due to their lower molecular weight, they are uh, way easier to uh, dissolve in organic mm. solvents. Okay, okay. But also their functionality can play a role. Yeah, yeah, so, so when we go to chapter three, and that's why I was so uh, impressed about chapter three, uh, especially on, on uh, what's behind, because I still do not completely understand what is all behind. Uh, and you said in your conclusions you have an extraction method mm-hmm. um, or let's say uh, first a liquid liquid method with dichloromethane which you extract twice and then again back uh, extraction from water uh, and then I thought yeah but if you extract from the uh, dichloromethane to water you will only see your monomers so you will get rid of your oligomers and you will not find them back so actually your application is not a mixture of oligomers and uh, dimers, but just monomers. Uh, did you not see that in your de- analytical data? So the goal uh, to perform the extraction with uh, water and dichloromethane uh, was to remove sugars present after uh, the polymerization of wood. Because uh, in the method itself, first uh, wood chips were used. But then why did you do the back extraction? Because you extracted a volume of one to four to water. Yeah, then I agree. You take all the polar polar compounds, so the sugars Mm -hmm. out of that oil. Uh, But then the water you back extracted with four times uh, dichloromethane. And that fraction you analyzed. So that would be very small lignine or apolar molecules. So which molecules were they? Or did I completely miss... Understand. So page 67 that mm-hmm. was. 67. So what happened? Uh, no, th- sorry, it was 65. Uh, I'm, I, I excuse. Uh, on the 65 at the bottom, you say 
you extract back the water four times and then you have three fractions and you bring those fractions together but those fractions will have very low molecular weight rather polar monomers But the fraction which was used in this research was the DCM fraction. Ah, okay. So the first DCM fraction, not the one. Yes. Okay. So in so what happened in uh, in this part is that you have DCM fraction which contains lignin-based uh, molecules, mm -hmm. and in uh, the original fraction after depolymerization, this fraction also contains some sugars. Okay. And we used water extraction uh, against DCM to remove the sugars and keep lignin-based oligomers and monomers in the DCM uh, okay. phase. Okay. One, one small question. Yeah. So linked to that, huh? so the other extraction, you call that extraction, and this is another one, was hexane. Now, you switch from dichloromethane to hexane, but hexane is really apolar. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other one is the membrane fractionation extraction, but I think membranes are not extracting extraction is partitioning over two phases and then in the end like you said the conclusion was yeah better not to do all this work and just throw in the whole mixture um, but is that not then giving an answer to the question that in the mixture there are the oligomers and in all your extraction methods you throw away the oligomers in what happened in, uh, in the system is that when you want to purify uh, lignin fractions, as we did in uh, chapter three, we wanted to maintain oligomers and remove monomers. So it was always the intention to use oligomers as such. But we also explored uh, what is the efficiency of isolation of monomers and oligomers. And as you can see in chapter three, Mm -hmm. uh, we noticed that even though we were able to remove a part of uh, monomers, this uh, separation was never complete. Okay. I think for later discussions on figure number two, because I think it's intriguing. Thank okay. you. Thank, Thank you, you very Mr. much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Honing. Then uh, we will now move online and move to uh, Wageningen. Uh, let me see if that works. And um, uh, the the uh, opposition will now be continued by Dr. Uh, Gosselink. He's from the Wageningen Food and Biobased Research Institute uh, with expertise on uh, lignin valorization and biorefinery. Please, Dr. Gosselink. Thank you, Director, for the introduction. Uh, dear candidate, dear Monica, thank you for uh, finalizing and writing this very interesting uh, thesis. Um, you showed a lot of uh, of progressing work in the lignin field, which I really acknowledge and um, yeah, nice to see that you uh, finalized that. Um, I would like to start with some questions on uh, chapter one. In the introduction, you uh, told uh, about the, uh, the different side streams and, and streams you could use uh, for your um, uh, for obtaining your lignin. One of the, the streams I, I didn't see there was really uh, side streams like uh, coconut husk or palm or trunk or wood bark. Do you think that these streams, really side streams, could be a better alternative to use in your biorefinery approach? Can I? Uh, thank you, esteemed opponent, uh, for this very interesting and relevant question. Uh, when describing different methodologies which can be used uh, to isolate lignin from, from the materials, I concentrated uh, more on what is the methodology itself, not what is the size, the stream uh, which can be used. But I definitely agree that uh, side streams like uh, husk, coconut husk can be used to produce lignin uh, with uh, high efficiency. <laughs> then on uh, page five, you talked about, uh, and you explained very well in your introduction uh, presentation, the lignin first approaches. Uh, there are many of them. Um, do you have, uh, and, and, and could, you, could you elaborate a little bit more 
which process do you prefer to um, produce the lignin aromatics to conduct your uh, further up work? Uh, it, it probably comes as no surprise that uh, I would rather select a lignin first approach uh, because this approach gives an amazing opportunity to first valorize lignin and lignin based molecules uh, without their degradation and still gives us an opportunity to further process cellulose part. While in lignin cellulose first processes, lignin is often degraded and this opportunity is taken away and that's why current lignin which is currently available on the market is mostly burned for energy. Yes, I fully agree with you. And uh, another question on that is, do you believe that these new uh, lignin first by refineries uh, can be expected in the near future? And we have now the, uh, the other processes we are really optimized and already there for a long time. Do you think that these new processes will take over in some period? This is a bit difficult question. Uh, up to my knowledge, uh, some of these uh, processes are currently upscaled. Uh, so there is definitely their future on the market, but we also have to realize that uh, cellulose first processes uh, are used for making paper. And this is still a very uh, big market. And I don't think that this is the end of cellulose first processes, even if the lignin first processes are still very successful. Okay, but I can imagine that the advantage of a lignin first uh, process is that you have, let's say, the co production of a high quality cellulose, but also a high quality lignin fraction. That could be a big advantage. Do you agree on that? I do agree on that, but also with a small disclaimer that uh, we have a cellulose fraction in a lignin f uh, first processes, but this cellulose fraction has to be still fervently purified. Thanks for that. Then I move on to uh, to chapter two. Basically on page 35, your approach is there to develop a um, PF resin without using phenol and formaldehyde, which is of course a very interesting topic and there's a lot of interest from the industry as well. Um, the question here is uh, you choose the P1000 uh, soda lignin. What is the rationale behind that to use that lignin? The rationale to use P1000 lignin as well as a fraction after its solvolysis is that this lignin has relatively low molecular weight. And this is also known in literature that lignin with high molecular weights are harder to be incorporated in phenylformaldehyde resins. Uh, and we expect that using lower molecular uh, weight lignins helps to incorporate them successfully and have acceptable performance of the resin. Okay, I fully agree that uh, the low molecular weight is, is an important uh, feature. But do you think that uh, if you look at the building units in the lignin, uh, could a lignin from a non wood be a, a better uh, or may, maybe a more reactive lignin compared to? Uh, to other lignins. So speaking of uh, chemistry of, of lignin itself, when uh, when we discuss uh, chemistry like phenolformaldehyde, in this uh, kind of chemistry, it's uh, really important to have uh, as many uh, ortho and para positions available, and therefore lignin, which is highly substituted, is less suitable to be applied. So. Uh, soda lignin, which contains uh, relatively more of less substitute units, is definitely uh, more uh, more suitable to be applied. Okay. Uh, according to the time, I have still one question to go, I guess. Um, that one is, uh, the, the, the P1000 is, is available in limited amounts. Uh, if you compare it to a craft lignin, which is uh, in, in bulky amounts available, could craft lignin uh, do the same job here compared to soda lignin? And in particular, if you also consider the presence of the tile group in the craft lignin. 
I didn't study craft lignin, uh, but also one should uh, keep in mind uh, the molecular weight uh, of craft lignin, which can be higher. Uh, and also uh, the amount of impurities is also relatively higher than in a soda P1000 lignin. So I would expect that a craft lignin would perform worse, but I, don't, I didn't perform this research, so I cannot fairly comment on that. I agree. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Dr. Hosling. And I forgot to mention earlier, Dr. Hosling also was a member of the assessment committee. Um, the opposition will now be continued um, by Professor uh, Tielemans, who was also a member of the assessment committee. And he holds uh, a chair in chemical engineering. He will be joining us uh, from abroad, from the Catholic Universiteit Leuven. Uh, Professor Tielemans. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, my apologies that I couldn't be present uh, uh, in person, but my flight from uh, Lausanne was delayed, so uh, I'm now um, online. Um, it's um, my, my um, first question is, is on the uh, chapter two where you talk about uh, your link. So thank you very much for, uh, for your thesis and, and, and for the nice work. Um, we already had uh, discussions in the in the previous um, in the previous session. Um, when um, when you do your crosslinking with the uh, propergyl uh, modified lignans, um, you react for about five minutes. Is there a reason why uh, your reaction is so short? Thank you, highly esteemed opponent. Uh, the reason why uh, the reaction is. Uh is so fast is uh, that this is one of the clique chemistry reactions and they are known from being efficient and fast and this reaction is also thermally initiated which uh, can definitely help with uh, achieving short and shorter reaction uh, times yeah but then, then of, of, of course thermodynamically your reaction will be will be very fast um but if but, but because you, you're going to have diffusion limitations, and, and you mentioned that also in your work that that your reaction is slowed down because because of of, of limited chain mobility, um, could could it be that if you let your reaction go longer, that you get that you get a higher crossing density? I think that at certain uh, moment you will reach the plateau uh, upon which uh, you will no longer be able to really. Uh, obtain higher crosslinking density because of the boundaries of the system, that crosslinking density would be already so high that you cannot obtain higher crosslinking density really at set temperature. But if you take, if you take a, uh, a typical, um, just free radically polymerized resin, um, just a normal, normal acrylate, uh, when 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 you add your free radical uh, like AIBN like you used and you do your polymerization uh, free radically at say 120 degrees and it'll stop but then if you raise your temperature higher to to 150 or 160 so you do a post cure without adding any any anything extra you also get a higher cross density because of that post cure so you can actually push your reaction just just like that. And that's also what uh, I did in this research uh, with uh, thermal post curing uh, strategy using Kleisen rearrangement. Uh, that these uh, resins were fairly cross linked uh, at higher temperature. Yeah, but, 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 but there you say you have a, you have a second reaction. I'm, I'm just saying if you, if you keep your reaction for a longer time, even at 115 degrees like you do initially, um, you, you might get a higher cross density. So do, do you? Do you know how you could determine the crossing density of your polymer? Well, we did this as uh, insoluble fractions. We determined uh, uh, what what was uh, crossing density based on this. In, but, but, but to determine the crossing density in, inside your polymer, so you have your crossing polymer, and then you can determine your crossing density, so you can determine how many of your uh, alkyne groups and how many of your styles have actually reacted. In this research, I, I did that uh, 
uh, by determining uh, what is the intensity of the peaks in infrared spectrum. And by this, I determined uh, what is the fraction of uh, triple bonds which already reacted uh, with uh, tile or with uh, which reacted. Yeah, but there you could also get get some some kind of cycles that that, that are formed. So normally, if you do, if you do um, dynamic mechanical analysis and you look at your um, your um, um, your rubbery region, you can determine your your uh, crosslink density, and so you could actually follow it as a function of curing time and 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 uh, and, and 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 yeah, the the ratio of your different reagents. So you could you could actually determine how efficient your reaction is. I do agree. We did something similar to to study curing, uh, to determine curing temperature, in uh, in chapter uh, two, uh, where I actually did uh, curing in rheometer to determine uh, the uh, cross point of uh, G prime and G double prime to determine at which uh, temperature. Uh, the uh, the sample crosslinks. Yeah, the, 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 the transition between your your liquid and your solid state, where you get your crossover of G prime and G double prime, but you could actually determine the amount of crosslinks per per square centimeter or the per cubic centimeter or per cubic meter, uh, for example. So you could you could um, you, you 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 could you could get more information uh, out of it because then when when you do your post cure. Um, you do get quotient re rearrangement, and then you get the reaction between the um, between the double bonds in the um, in the six rings. Uh, but do you have any idea how much of your um, how much of your additional crosslinking is due to that reaction, and how much is actually due to um, the 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 thioline, um, Click reaction. Thank you for this question. Unfortunately, this was not studied, and uh, I cannot comment on that. Uh, and I think that it may be quite difficult to determine what was exactly uh, the amount of uh, crosslinks created uh, upon Kleisen rearrangement, and what was uh, uh, what was the amount of crosslinks created uh, via ethylene chemistry at elevated temperature compared to what was already okay. created at lower temperature. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah it, it might be very difficult, but uh, yeah, maybe in uh, with your, with your uh, spectroscopy, you might you might get some idea, but um, I, I, I don't know. Um, and in terms of the uh, propagulation of, of lignin, um, could you explain why your phenolic OH is more reactive than your aliphatic OH? Sorry, could you uh, repeat your question because it I get some audio issues. Okay, um, when you have your propagulation of of lignin, um, so uh, your lignin uh, um, reacting, you you get a different reactivity for your phenolic OH and for your aliphatic OH. Uh, could you explain why your uh, phenolic OH is more reactive in that reaction than uh, your aliphatic OH? This comes from a uh, different reactivity, which is known for uh, aromatic uh, alcohols, such as phen phenolic uh, structures, uh, compared to aliphatic ones. And what uh, really takes, uh, what really plays uh, a big role uh, in this difference is that uh, in case of uh, phenolic uh, OHs, you have um, aromatic structures in which the electrons are uh, destabilized and uh, you also have electron withdrawing effects with metoxys groups which increase reactivity uh, of phenolic OHs compared to aliphatic uh, OHs. Yeah, but what, what, what is the actual reaction mechanism that happens there? Uh, this is a substitution reaction. Yeah, so you have a little bromide that's being being attacked by by your OH. So, so what is actually doing the attacking? Uh, sorry. What, what, 
what, what is actually doing the attacking? So, so how, how, how does the actual mechanism work? Mm. What happens is that in this reaction is that the phenolic OH is substituted with propahyl moiety. Yeah, yeah. On, on the actual mechanism. So, so in 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 the mechanism, you have you have certain electrons that that react with the with the delta positive center, um, because the electrons do all the work of forming the bonds. So, so, so what actually happens? Uh, what happens is that uh, in a first uh, step. Uh, we have uh, phenolic OH, so the OH attacks the uh, propahyl bromide molecule and then the bromide is a leaving group and uh, we have formation of uh, propahylated uh, molecule. Yeah, it's a free electron pair of, of your OH group, which actually attacks the, the delta positive carbon of your carbon halide bond. Um, and because your phenolic OH is, is, uh, is more acidic, it has a higher negative charge, um, which is why it becomes more reactive. Um, but the reason the reason I wanted to go in, into that is, is is because you 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 compare your results with a with an other study, um, where they found that only the phenolic OH groups were modified, whereas you modified pretty much all your phenolic OH and only half of your aliphatic OH, but still half of the aliphatic OHs. Um, so I was just wondering how how different your reaction mechanisms were, um, and whether you use conditions where the acidity of your OH is more important than in the work that um, that you compare your uh, your results with. Can you briefly comment on that? Uh, to very briefly comment on that, uh, the conditions which were used in the comparative work uh, used were completely different, and in that. Uh, reference they used modification of uh, lignin in aqueous uh, uh, in aqueous solutions while uh, in this uh, work uh, the modification was performed in organic solvent yeah so for, for the, uh, polar solvent which which um, yeah which would well, which would reduce the uh, the effect of the acidity Good, thank you. Um, and then in chapter three, when, um, when you do your multiplication uh, of your ligand, you have three different ligands. So you have your mixture, you have your extracted, and you have the one that's separated with the membrane. When you do your reaction, the one that is extracted has a very different reactivity than the mixture and the one that's membrane separated. Do you have uh, any idea why that is? Very brief answer, because in view of time, I will have to move on to the next uh, opponents. Oh. Uh, to give a very brief answer, <laughs> uh, I indeed noticed uh, that phenomena that extracted uh, sample was modified up to lesser degree. Unfortunately, I don't have understanding why that happens. Okay, thank you. Okay, then we're gonna Thanks save that for the, for the after discussion, for the party. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Tielemans. Then uh, the opposition will uh, be continued by uh, Professor uh, Averus. Uh, Professor Averus is uh, holding a chair in polymer chemistry and he's from the University de Strasbourg. Thank you very much. Perfect uh, pronunciation, Averus. So it's good. Uh, first, I, I want to thank um, the supervisor, Monica, for the invitation. Well, it's always a a pleasure for me to discuss about uh, lignin valorization. So, uh, congratulations for the yeah for the PhD. A lot of work has been done. Well, I have some questions, of course. Um, I have a, first. I want to start with the general question. Uh, my my question is: um, How did you determine the different type of application that you develop? Because you develop adhesive, coaching, uh, antioxidants, and so on. How did you determine these different applications? Highly esteemed opponent, uh, the motivation for different applications uh, was 
partially due to the boundaries of the projects uh, I was involved in. So some of the applications were already uh, predefined. Uh, however, I had a lot of freedom to execute uh, uh, certain applications in the most uh, suitable way I, uh, I considered. Thank you for your answer. But I have another question concerning what lignin is an aromatic chemical, and then you use the lignin to develop polymers. So what is the interest to bring aromaticity to the polymers in terms of behaviors, performance, and so on? What is the interest to, to bring aromaticity? Well, lignin in polymeric materials can bring a lot of uh, strength. And that's uh, why uh, I think it's very interesting material to uh, to work with. Uh, I, uh, additionally, lignin can also bring antioxidant properties as well as UV blocking. So that may lead to reduced amount of additives which can be used when lignin is incorporated in polymeric structure. What, you, what, what do you mean with strength? Like tensile properties, for instance. Okay, mechanical properties. So, no, because th thermal resistance or fire resistance and so on. For instance, as per uh, thermal resistance, lignin is thermally stable until approximately 180 degrees, which is not the most thermally stable polymer. Uh, in my view. Uh, as per uh, flame retendant properties, in lignin can be used as flame retendant. However, in order to really utilize its fullest performance, it should be modified, uh, for instance, by introducing uh, phosphor uh, groups, like phosphorylated lignin or ciliated lignin is way better a flame retendant than native lignin itself. Okay. Uh, so in chapter two and three, so you develop um, click chemistry, which is based on a chol in reaction. Did you consider during your thesis other type of click chemistry than the chol in reaction? And why did you use only mainly chol in reaction? The reason why I used uh, tail in reaction was that I wanted to develop a suitable alternative uh, to phenolformaldehyde uh, chemistry. And this particular chemistry, tail in chemistry, allowed me uh, to use a phenolic OHs as a, a modification point. And I was not lo no longer bounded by the availability of ortho and para positions as in uh, phenolformaldehyde uh, chemistry. And of course, there are other possibilities, different uh, kind of chemistries, for instance, uh, epoxies, which can also be used in uh, these uh, applications or polyurethanes. Uh, however, this uh, chemistry was no long, was not reported uh, before, and that also uh, made me more interested in exploring why. <laughs> Okay, okay, I understand perfectly now. Um, so ju just now I want to come back on the determination by DSC of, of the glass transition. Um, you, 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 ne you never give the standard deviation on the determination of the temperature. And well, I, I, I'd like that you comment on the precision on the uh, determination of the temperature by TG. Uh, yes. Uh, glass transition temperature can be uh, tested uh, via different methods, and DSC is definitely one of them. Uh, however, there are other uh, techniques uh, such as uh, DMTA, which can be used to develop uh, to determine uh, glass transition temperature as well. My question. But I disagree on this point because by a GMA, you determine a relaxation temperature. And then you can, after, say that this relaxation temperature or it's equivalent to the TG, but by GMA, you don't determine a, a TG. 
my, my question is about the standard deviations on the, the determination of the temperature. All the digit that you give, uh, you give uh, uh, a digit after the point. For example, on uh, table three, chapter two, where 20.7, uh, 16.1, and so on and so on. Mm. Sorry, could you repeat the page number? Uh, table three, chapter two, page 48. Mm. Yes. In this table, I indeed uh, indicated two TGs. And uh, yeah, but, but the standard division. Mm. So the difference between those two TGs is that one uh, TG is reported just for thiolene reaction, while the other one, denoted as PC, is after a thermal post curing, and therefore we have two different uh, TGs. If that's your question, okay. My um, last uh, question is about uh, chapter two, uh, figure number five. So, how did you determine the level of acceptable performance? The level of uh, acceptable performance was yes. Uh, thank you very much for this question. The level of acceptable performance was defined in one of the national norms as 0 0.7 uh, megapascal. There is an industrial uh, standard uh, which assess whether uh, this uh, mechanical performance is acceptable or not. And this level was defined as 0 0.7 megapascal. And on uh, page 49, uh, there is a name of the standard, uh, and this is uh, GBT 14732-2006 uh, 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 national standard. <laughs> Okay. Thank you very much for your answer. Thank you very much, Professor um, Averus. So we'll now continue the opposition, uh, and it will be done by uh, Dr. Uh, Eersels, who is today also acting as a secretary to the committee. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, candidate. Uh, congratulations on a nice thesis, nice defense. Uh, I have some questions, of course, so I'll start immediately with Chapter 3 where you use lignin in an uh, anti-corrosive coating. Uh, you mentioned there are several options and, and you went for incorporating lignin as a component of the thermoset resin, as opposed to using it, for instance, in a thermoplastic re resin. Uh, was this aimed at a specific application or what was the reason for going for this choice? Thank you, esteemed uh, opponent. Uh, the reason why we wanted to incorporate lignin in uh, this form was uh, that we wanted to utilize fully the interactions lignin can provide with metal surface uh, thanks to their OH uh, groups, which can uh, promote adhesion of uh, the resin uh, to, the metal coat, to the metal surface. Okay, thank you. Uh, my next question is on uh, the sa same chapter. In figure four, you did uh, impedance spectroscopy to determine how well the anti-corrosion effect of the coating works. Uh, you have an hypothesis that you observed that there is some non-linearity observed in the system and you hypothesize that that might be to electrolyte uptake. Can you elaborate on this a bit and is there any reason that you only see it at higher frequencies? The reason why uh, we suspect that there may be uh, an electrolyte uh, uptake 
is that this is something which is commonly seen in another uh, systems uh, and this is quite uh, quite common in uh, OPR uh, eyes and this is um, what was confirmed uh, also by our project partners in this work. Oh, and uh, did you also measure at higher frequencies or would that be useful at all? Uh, this work was not performed. We didn't measure it in higher uh, frequencies and unfortunately uh, I cannot uh, answer this question because this is a bit uh, uh, outside the scope of this thesis, but okay. uh, now I'm also curious what would be the answer <laughs> to this question. <laughs> ah, that's why I'm asking, but uh, <laughs> in figure six, you also show that uh, when you keep the coating for longer, for instance, 21 days, you see that um, the face angle, right, the, the shift shifts from more negative regions, so more minus 90, which is more capacitive, to lower regions, which is more resistive. And you do hypothesize that, well, that might be due to the, the, the coating actually breaking down, maybe. Uh, but you say, okay, it's not statistically relevant, but let's say it is, right, because you already had some hypotheses there. Why do you feel that it only appears in the lower frequency range there? Thank you for this excellent question. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, my knowledge uh, with this uh, particular topic was is limited to the fact that I realized that uh, once uh, you have a transition towards uh, more uh, resistive coating, then uh, the protection of the metal is not that uh, good as uh, for, uh, it's not, not that good. Therefore, uh, what we aim for is that uh, the, the, freak, uh, the angle is uh, around uh, minus 190 because then we have the best uh, anti corrosive properties. Indeed, because when, indeed, when the coating is intact and you would have like a metal, then the coating, mm -hmm. and then of course electrolyte, so basically a capacitor. Uh, the reason that I'm asking is that you would expect it to, I would expect it to occur at like maybe higher frequencies rather than the low, but I mean, it is what it is, right? The data are what they are. Um, then we'll move on to, to chapter four, where I had like a question, uh, because you said, and this also ties a little bit into what you say in, in proposition seven, uh, you mentioned that, um, Lignin is biodegradable and less toxic in, cer in certain circumstances due to the additives that are usually used in lubricants. Uh, but did you test the biodegradability of the lubricant? Uh, and if not, do you think it's biodegradable? Uh, thank you for this question. We did not test biodegradability. Uh, however, based on what is uh, known, I would expect that this uh, would be biodegradable by, for instance, uh, fungi. Okay, thank you. Monica Janjrejcik, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. Um, I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return in this room. I adjourn. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes.
waste all your time Cause I'll go, I'll go, I'll go the extra mile Long road to the south side Ten miles in my rearview mirror I know what it felt like My goal's only getting clearer East side to the west side No place like home If there's questions that you've got Go the extra mile and die on the dash, got my laces tied. Long road, I don't waste no time. Break rules because fate decides. With the team and we chase the light. I make a move, fall down, shake it off. I hate to lose that branch, break it off. No room for negativity, praise and love. Prepare for deep park, cause we're taking off. Get the mileage,
I reopened the session. Monica Jandrejcik, the degree committee here present, has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. In view of this positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Uh, Professor Bernhardt is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. Belooft u dat u altijd volgens de beginselen van wetenschappelijke integriteit te werk zult gaan. Eerlijk en zorgvuldig, transparant, onafhankelijk en verantwoordelijk. Yes, I promise. Krachtens de bevoegdheid ons door de wet toegekend, volgens het besluit van de commissie hier tegenwoordig, verklaar ik hierbij u, Monika Alexandra Jandrijcek, tot dokter te bevorderen en u alle rechten te verlenen die daaraan volgens wet en gewoonte zijn verbonden. Ten bewijze hiervan overhandig ik u nu de bul door rector, secretaris en overige leden van de promotiecommissie ondertekend en met het grootzegel van de universiteit bevestigd. Dear Dr. Jandrejcek, dear Monica, I still remember the first time we met. It was for your job interview in Building 110, which doesn't exist anymore, but where everything started for our group. It must have been March or April 2016, directly after the terroristic attacks in Brussels. You were quite impressed by the military power present at the airport of Charleroi upon your arrival. Stefan and I were interviewing PhD can candidates in parallel. And when I crossed Stefan in the corridor after the interview with you, he whispered to me, she is the best. You came well prepared to the interview, and also me, you made a good impression. We hired you, and I'm very proud to be standing here at your defense. A PhD is a journey, and a journey is not always easy, also your journey. Especially the beginning was difficult, but you showed character and did not give up. You were the first person in my lab working on lignin, and that meant you had to figure it out all yourself. Many people who are currently working on lignin in the lab still benefit from your hard work and the methods you implemented. You also had the challenge to be in two consortia, BioHard and Lignin Riches, which meant double reporting, double meetings, and double responsibilities. Unfortunately, especially in the beginning, it did not mean double amount of lignin samples from the consortium partners doing biorefinery, while you were dependent on that. I still remember that you received liters of sample, but upon evaporation, you were left with 200 milligrams of lignin. Try to do your PhD with it, but you did. Your work resulted in four papers in well-respected journals. Next to the collaborations within the consortia, you also built up fru fruitful external collaborations, resulting in nice papers. The work on mesoporous carbon with Professor de Klerk and Professor Bergmoes at UGent, and the anti-corrosive work uh, with Professor Terrain at VUB. At some point during your PhD, 
You came with the idea to work on lignin containing biolubricants with improved antioxidative properties. This idea not only led to a very nice paper in Asia Sustainable Chemistry and Engineering, but it was also the spark for your current job as a patent attorney. We considered to patent this work and we got in touch with the business developers and patent attorneys from our university. You compiled the invention disclosure form with a great eye for all the details, a character tweet that is really needed for this task. Unfortunately, you found some disturbing prior art and the patenting process stopped. On the other hand, this was the moment where you started to talk with the people from the patent company about their job, and from then on, you knew that this is what you wanted to do in the future. As always, if you want to achieve something, you have to work hard for it. So after PhD, you first continued in the lignin field at Vertoro, but it is great to see that you're now making your dream uh, true at, as a certified patent attorney. I'm sure you will manage and you will do a good job. Monica, I want to thank you for everything you did in the lab, for the person you were in the group, and for the friendship we built up. Good luck in future and stay in touch. Thank you, Catherine, for very kind words. <laughs> Dear Dr. Jan Drejcik, uh, also on behalf of Maastricht University, I congratu congratulate you and um, your family and your supervisors and um, all your friends and colleagues present here with the degree you have acquired. Um, that brings us to the end of the official part of the ceremony. Um, so I will formally close the session. Uh, a few instructions for what happens next. Um, we plan to make some more uh, photographs also with, with the opposition uh, that took place online. Uh, and thank you very much once again for participating from abroad. That is very much appreciated um, from Maastricht University. Um, after these photos, we will still take some more photos on the stairs. And everyone who is not interested in taking photos can already join for the reception.